Good evening and warm welcome to Power News, your window to the power sector. I'm Juhi Rajput. First of all, let me bring you the quick updates from the power sector. Credit rating agency ICRA has warned that power distribution companies' overall subsidy dependence could rise in financial year 2015 as states will likely avoid a sharp tariff hike in an election year, despite increase in power purchase costs for discoms. In such a scenario, discoms could face cash flow problems and there could be issues related to compliance with the financial restructuring package if subsidy payment is delayed by state governments. According to the ICRA estimate, state government subsidy liabilities to the power sector will be at Rs 60,000 crore in financial year 2014. India's PSU hydropower companies are setting up projects entailing combined investments of Rs 20 to 25,000 crore in Bhutan. The Himalayan Kingdom has allocated four projects to NHPC, SJVN and THTC for implementation in joint ventures with Bhutan's state-owned companies. Kholungchu of 600 megawatt and Wangchu of 570 megawatt projects have been allocated to SJVN, while NHPC and THTC have gorged Chamkarchu of 770 megawatt and Wangchu of 180 megawatt, respectively. Indian banks and financial institutions are expected to finance these projects. Narendra Modi led Gujarat government has banned state based companies from sourcing electricity from other states, a move that will compel them to buy costly power from government run utilities. The decision ahead of the general elections beginning next month will affect companies across the industries. Discom's cost will rise by at least Rs 2.75 per unit of electricity as they will have to pay close to Rs 7 for a unit of electricity supplied by state-run utilities. Against Rs 4.25 they were paying earlier. Gujarat-based industries import close to 1,000 megawatt power from other states through trade on electricity exchanges, while state-run utilities have almost 2,500 megawatt of idle generation capacity. The decision has come as a surprise for the industry as Modi, who is the Bharti Janta Party's nominee from Prime Ministership, has been selling Gujarat's supposedly industry-friendly environment in his poll campaign. And now the news of the week. Lack of electricity may play the spoiler in a clutch of states, including the key electoral battleground of Uttar Pradesh, in the run-up to the Lok Sabha elections. The northern grid to which these states belong does not have the required electricity transmission corridor for sourcing power from the western region. While states across the country are gearing up to provide round-the-clock electricity for the 16th Lok Sabha elections, the northern grid comprising UP, Punjab, Rajasthan, Haryana, Delhi, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Jammu and Kashmir and Chandigarh can only source 44 megawatts under the short-term market from the western grid. These eight states account for 146 of the 543 seats in the Lok Sabha and have been blamed for India's worst grid failure. Of these, UP sends the maximum number of 80 lawmakers to the lower house, followed by Rajasthan. The bottleneck is the inter-regional, the northern region and eastern region, eastern region and western region, western region and southern region, western region and northern region, they are all highly choked. This needs to be expanded. I think more focus has to be given by all the political parties as well as the utilities to go in for heavy investments and do I would prefer to go for an over-investment. That will create the infrastructure for better tomorrow. The trade in electricity sees a spike during elections as states fearful of a political backlash buy additional power to avoid outages. Today we see that there will be sufficient capacity available, sufficient power will be available, except few states where they don't want to buy because they don't have a capacity to pay. Today, a UP still faces shortage of about 2000 megawatt, but they are not buying it because they don't want to actually serve those customers which are not getting service today. So they have fixed that uh, major, uh, except few major cities or constituencies, the other constituencies they will have say uh, 8 hours of load trading or 6 hours of load trading and that may continue. But if they want to buy power, there is no problem. Exchange is there and lot of power is available on the exchange and prices are also not as high as used to be there. So we are facing currently the power prices on the exchanges is about 250 to 3 rupees per unit. And that's a good price for anyone to buy power on the exchange. So we feel that uh, that electricity won't be a spoiler in this uh, elections. There is not enough transmission facility declared for short-term market for the transfer of electricity from the western region to the northern region states. 
the maximum that can be transferred from the western region to the northern region under the short term is only 44 megawatt similarly there is a southern region which which is actually cut off from the entire nation as of now so once we see the market also in southern region you will see on a particular day 20 rupees tariff in a short term market on the same day in the northern region in maybe december or january 2nd to be precise the tariff will be 10 paisa these are two very, uh, what I can say that uh, extremes of a power market. I think the solution lies in expanding the transmission facilities. I think all the political parties should focus at least in their election manifesto, manifesto stating that when they talk about electricity for all, they should also say that the infrastructure for all, that should be the key buzzword. The pre-election phase in India is always difficult for the power sector. In most cases, tariff hikes are postponed, there is clamour for more benefits for farmers and residential customers, and the subsidy burden increases for local state governments. So it is not surprising that some of these states have already started to pursue this agenda. Here we'll take a short break, but there's a lot more on the other side. Stay tuned. Indian Energy Exchange, India's premier power trading platform. From manufacturing of energy cables to EHV installations to renewable energy solutions to retail energy products, our technology energizes lives. Ravin, energizing lives. When you are determined to be a winner, your desire to conquer is fueled by the power of your instinct. With eyes set on the target, you create your own path. Your determination inspires you to never give in. Then emerges a creator of a winning journey. Blazing a trail for others to follow. We are Jindal Paul Limited. Power Grid Corporation of India, the central transmission utility, world-class integrated global transmission company, with dominant leadership in merging power market, ensuring reliability, safety and economy. Power Grid, building a smarter grid. Welcome back. The land acquisition law has become a big hurdle for private companies with coal blocks as sections of the government have cited the statute to oppose transfer of adjoining land owned by state firms to private firms, which need it for mining operations. Several companies have asked for diversion of coal-bearing land that overlaps with the adjacent blocks of subsidiaries of Coal India for requirements such as storing heavy mining machinery and dumping overburdened soil. Different sections of the government have taken opposing views on the matter despite the Attorney General's view that there is no legal problem in transferring such land. Lack of clarity on transfer of coal-bearing land to private firms in the government department could hit 36 coal blocks owned by companies like Reliance Power, SR Power, Lanco Infratech, Jindal Steel and & Power and Monet Ispath & Energy. The Ministry of Rural Development has denied transfer of coal-bearing area to blocks of Reliance Power's Sasan Ultra Mega Power Project. The Department of Land Resources, in its commitment to a cabinet note circulated by the Coal Ministry, has said such transfer is not possible under the New Land Acquisition Act. The Coal Ministry's move was followed by consent of the Attorney General of India, who opined that the coal-bearing land could be transferred to the private firm. The transfer proposes to give Reliance Power right access to mine 1,050 hectares of overlapping land and surface rights for another 500 hectares of land. And now some news from renewable energy sector. Solar and wind energy companies are waiting for the government to clear subsidies amounting to more than rupees 1,000 crore as they stare at potentially unviable projects which they had launched due to the promise of incentives. 
The Ministry of New and Renewable Energy is unable to pay the promised subsidies since it has received just a third of its budgetary allocation of Rs 1,521 crore for 2013-14. And to make matters worse, the allocation for the next fiscal has been reduced by as much as 71% to Rs 441 crore. India offers generation-based incentives to wind energy projects and small solar projects of 100 kW to 2 MW to help them compete with conventional energy. The government had last disbursed the incentives to wind energy companies in August 2013 for the period of April-September 2012. Developers said the total backlog is at least Rs 600 crore. The amount pending for solar energy companies is about Rs 550 crore. Okay, we uh, understand that there are some outstanding payments which have to be released and uh, uh, the sector has grown quite a bit. So our normal budget flow is not now enough to cover our requirements. So we've asked for more money and uh, we are in constant discussion with the finance ministry. We've been promised that some money would be made available, particularly from the National Clean Energy Fund. So hopefully we'll get some extra money and I think we'll be able to clear the liabilities. The delay in disbursement of incentives comes at a time when some developers are already facing delays from the state utilities and payments. This is impacting cash flow and the ability of developers to repay loans. I agree that developers are facing a little bit of a problem. It is because of these delayed payments and because of that sometimes their payments to banks are also getting affected and uh, distribution companies are also sometimes delaying payments. In the case of solar, we've uh, set up a payment security fund uh, where we are we have put in some money so that if there is delayed payment from the distribution companies, we pay immediately and then the and the money comes uh, from the distribution companies later on. So uh, NVVN, which is our implementing agency, is doing this on our behalf and it's working very well. And uh, as far as other payments from our side are concerned, we are trying to liquidate at the earliest. The disbursement of capital subsidies is getting delayed since the market is growing very fast and MNRE don't have the resources to pay out. But MNRE has been given the confidence that the money will be released from the National Clean Energy Fund. Well, the situation is not that bad. We have recently received 75 crores, which will be disbursed this week. Further, uh, the application spending for wind GBI are 160 crores and for solar is 100 crores. It is expected that either the government will get these funds from NCF or maybe the budgetary allocation for which they will have to wait. India aims to add 30,000 megawatt of renewable power capacity in the next four years, doubling it from the current capacity. The expansion of wind energy and more recently solar power capacity in the last few years has been driven primarily by incentives. Well, it is incentives definitely will be available. There could be some delay in getting these incentives. The major issue to my mind could only be because the AD had been withdrawn from wind projects and AD was contributing around 1000 to 1200 megawatt every year. So maybe there could be a shortfall of 3000 megawatt for wind projects. So out of 30,000 megawatt, if at all there is a shortfall that could be in wind. Solar, hopefully we will be able to somehow manage. So uh, it's not, the situation is not that bad as it is being made out, but uh, if also, the wind industry picks up steam further in next three years. Even the target could be met or there will be a little shortfall only. In 2007, the government introduced generation-based incentives for wind and solar power in an attempt to weed out non-serious players and increase participation of independent power players. The next big step by the government was introduction of the National Solar Mission in 2010, a program to add grid-connected solar power capacity. Similarly, you see there is a big growth of projects in solar in India today because market needs the power and needs it quickly. You can build a solar power plant in three to six months and very hard to do the same thing on conventional side. So if the market wants the power, the market will figure out a way to do this. What we need is the regulatory regime to not stifle that market driven growth. India launched incentives for renewable energy in the 1990s, accelerating capacity addition, especially in wind energy. Local and international firms and investors thrived on the incentives and upped the investment in the country, while individual investors like cricketer Sachin Tendulkar and film actress Ashwarya Rai were attracted to the sector. It's time for another short break. Keep watching PAV News.
Indian Energy Exchange, India's premier power trading platform. Jal, jal, jal. जल से जल तक मेगा वाटर से मेगा वॉट तक एस जे वी एन लिमिटेड पार फाइनेंस कॉर्पोरेशन द मोस्ट प्रिफर्ड फाइनेंशियल इंस्टीट्यूशन प्रोवाइडिंग अफोर्डेबल एंड कम्पेटिटिव प्रोडक्ट एंड सर्विसेज विद एफिशियंट एंड इंटरनेशनली इंटीग्रेटेड सोर्सिंग पी एफ सी पार्टनरिंग रिफॉर्म इन द इंडियन पार सेक्टर वेलकम बैक to talk on the various issues concerning indian power sector and the way forward today we have with us dr pramod deo former chairman cerc good evening dr deo and welcome to power news thank you first of all i'd like to ask you that according to you what are the most critical issues of power sector which needs to be addressed on urgent basis the most critical issue is the your distribution companies performance because after all electricity when it is generated by anyone and now since the number of private players in this field has increased and the share of private uh, generators now is reaching 35% and very soon in another 3 4 years it will be all almost, almost 50% so in that case the how these generators will be able to get money for the sub electricity that they supply it will entirely depend upon the financial health of distribution company and that's why this is the most critical issue how do you see the future for other plants struggling with higher production cost due to imported coal after the recent order of cerc on tata's mundra and adani project well the tata mundra and uh, adani mundra these two fall in a very different category because tata was a ultra mega power project and in the ultra mega power project it was based on imported coal and the issues involved there were that they were importing coal from indonesia and because of the change in indonesian law the coal prices have gone up in case of uh, adani it is a case where they had quoted based on some coal linkage that was given by coal india and since that linkage has not materialized to the extent that changes have been made so one cannot draw a parallel and say that all the those who are importing coal uh, would get the benefit one can draw similar parallels and in this order of the central city regulatory commission it's very clearly mentioned that there is no strong legal ground or there is no force major for such a claim that these two developers have made however keeping in view or taking a pragmatic view uh, a compensatory tariff on a temporary basis has been proposed after cerc's order on tata's mundra around 20 companies have approached regulatory body seeking higher rates for electricity they generate from wind solar or coal fired plants how do you see this trend see as far as the wind is concerned there is no competitive bidding for wind it is based on a cost plus return tariff so the question of increasing on the basis because the wind is not blowing according to does not arise because it is done on a normative basis as far as solar is concerned there was a competitive bidding and there are certain cases of solar thermal they have approached the central commission and central commission is hearing that so since the central commission still has not taken a view i would not like to hazard any opinion on that at this point once the central commission comes with an order then we can uh, revisit that and as far as the coal as i mentioned earlier it will depend upon case by case basis whether it is a case two bidding it is a case one type so this that will decide how it those cases will be dealt Electricity Act 2003 had brought together laws relating to generation transmission distribution and trading of electricity among others what are modifications are required in policy keeping in mind the present circumstances well the ministry of power has prepared a amendment to the law electricity act 2003 and they are on the website under discussion 
and some some of the shortcomings which you have noticed. Like very important one is the section 11. Section 11 is that the state government can direct generating companies to supply power to only within the state and not export it. So now this kind of a thing is not what the law had intended. But they, if there is some ambiguity and because of the certain court judgments, then in that case amendment to the law itself becomes uh, necessary. So there are certain important things which need to be taken care. But I am sure that there are other issues also because the whole idea was that we should dismantle single buyer model. But you will find that most many most states have created a new entity which is called the Central Power Purchase Trading Company or NTT. And so again the single buyer model has been brought back. So this is something which goes against the spirit of the law and so that also could be taken care by these amendments. What suggestions would you like to give for national tariff and segregating carriage and content in power distribution? See, the, one of the proposals in this amendment to the Electricity Act is that there should be separation of carriage and content. That means the lines will be owned by one company and you could have more than one supplier so they can use the same common line. Now here the issue is that this is a model which exists in UK and that could bring in competition. But essentially it begs the very basic issue because we are dealing with uh, distribution which is mo mostly owned by state government. So are the state governments really willing to privatize uh, supply business? Because since they own those lines, they could continue with government, but will they be allowing private players to come and become their competitors? So this being the very important issue and tariff is still treated by political executive as something on which they would like to have a control. So unless this issue is discussed with the states and there is an agreement how to go about it, I don't think just making an amendment is going to, this will be only an enabling provision. But whether it would be implemented or not is something which cannot be said today. It may become like the open access concept which we exist in the present act and it's still not happening. Thanks Dr. Dev for joining us in Power News. With this we come to an end of this episode of Power News. Keep sending us your suggestions and views at info at indianpowernews.com or call us on 011-405-60706. I'll be back next week with more news and updates. Till then, goodbye and take care.